Hi, um, this is the 25th episode of the Chat Chamber podcast, and uh, it's been a pleasure in this sunny day to welcome Ramon Sleidinch, and uh, he is the uh, co-founder and senior partner at Alex Klavinch in Latvia. <laughs> Hi, Ramon, how are you feeling today? Good, good. It's good to be here. Like I said, it's a sunny day, which is nice. Yeah, we'll see how it happens after yeah, yeah, uh, a yeah. few hours as yesterday. Maybe it will start to rain. Yeah. Um, so how was it start, the start of the day? Start of the day was a bit busy. It was uh, starting today. I was um, working online from home. So I had actually it's kind of an early morning. I had a bunch of stuff to take care of before coming here. I think I got most of it done, so I'm feeling okay, but there's still stuff waiting for me after the interview, so... But it's a good start to the day, at least. I mean, we can... So far, so good. We can definitely say thank you that you found time sure, for us. Sure, sure, my pleasure, yeah. Um, well, you're here because you're also uh, our visiting lecturer at RGSL, which we are very, very thankful of, and uh, to be honest, you've been my lecturer in mergers and acquisitions, too. So, yes. yeah, great course, <laughs> guys, great course. Um, so... I wanted to know, uh, how did you end up at RGSL? Like, what what was the thing? Whether you were asked, or it was your enthusiasm to uh, want to lecture also at some point in your life, or how did it happen? Well, it's, um, it, well, number one, we have our firm has a, has a long history with RGSL. We represented the Swedish government in, in establishing RGSL way back when. Um, and we've always taken an interest, a real interest in RGSL, uh, just you know, because of being there at the very founding of, of the school, and uh, and we donated we've donated a car. I remember at the very beginning we, don we donated a, a van. We gave the, the school its first car, and uh, and we've so so we've been very supportive of the school. We've been very interested. Uh, we've come to uh, you know events for potential students, these types of things. Um, and over time, um, uh, after the first few years, I guess Walid uh, spoke to, uh, addressed uh, myself and, and Zinta Jansons, who, who I, basically we've done the course together most most every year. And uh, yeah, he addressed us and asked us if we could do a course in in M and A. We kind of thought about it a little bit because we're not uh, we're not academia. We you know we're, we're, we're practitioners. We we work in the field and we know you know we know how the how how the M and A work you know goes. Um, but we weren't sure how that would fit in here. You know, being a practitioner, not from academia, you know, does that work? Walid was, <laughs> was very confident it would work. And so we tried it. And, and I, you know, it's been, I don't even know how many years we've been here. So it's more than 10 years, I think, now we've been doing wow. the course. And it's been really fun. We've really enjoyed it. Uh, at the beginning, it was just Zinta and myself, I think, doing all the lectures. Um, and what's been kind of fun for us, too, is that we've, uh, somewhere a few years back, we started involving other, uh, other colleagues from our firm uh, to speak about you know, specialty subjects that, they, that, they're, that is in their area of expertise. Um, so that's been, that's, been, that's been a nice aspect also, just kind of uh, involving other people from our firm. And uh, they've, they've enjoyed it as well, I think, being... You know, getting getting to be here in RGSL and being in touch with the students and being able to talk about a subject that they know about. So it's been a long t yeah, we've been here forever. <laughs> <laughs> you say that you uh, you see yourself more as a practitioner, and of course that is visible uh, from your experience. But um, still a JD in Santa Clara, so you have the academic, I would say. Well, power. but a JD, I mean, yeah, it's, it's a Juris Doctor. Uh, sounds very impressive, but in America, that's basically a law degree. Uh, you know, in America, the system is where you have the first four years to, for your first degree, the bachelor's degree, which I did at Berkeley and got it in political science, and then I went on to Santa Clara for the, the law degree. I haven't done anything above above that. Uh, so, so again, I'm not. Yeah, I don't consider myself academia necessarily. Um, um, yeah, I'm still just a lowly practitioner. <laughs> <laughs> but how did it happen? Uh, you you are American Latvian, and you uh, study there, and you live there for most of your life. And then, how did you decide to come to Latvia? And then, in '90s, founding a law firm. Mm -hmm how it happened. Yeah, it's a crazy story. I never would have planned it. And by the way, you mentioned most of my life in America. Actually, it's getting close to being most of my life in Latvia. Now, which is interesting. Yeah. I'm right at that okay. cusp, I think, okay. uh, okay. at this point. Um, yeah, never planned. I mean, it's, it's just, it was just a whole happenstance of circumstance uh, that, 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 that allowed me to have this opportunity, which I, which I, I never imagined I'd have. And it's, it's been really, really something I've, you know, I've, I'm really thankful for. But, but yeah, I mean, just, you know, not getting into details about my biography, <laughs> but yeah, I grew up in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, I was, my parents were Latvians who were refugees after World War II. Mm -hmm. 
And as a lot of the, you know, the, 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 the refugee Latvians who came over after World War II, my parents were, were like diehard Latvians. And they, you know, the, it was everything was to preserve the culture and because they were convinced that Latvia wouldn't exist anymore behind the Iron Curtain and, you know, we've got to keep it going here. So my parents did everything. Well, in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, the Latvian community wasn't very big. It was about, I don't know, maybe, you know, 500, 700 active people. Maybe there, there were more people there, but not active necessarily. Um, so you sort of had to do everything in that community. And so my parents and uh, they, 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 they my, for instance, my mother uh, led the Latvian school. We had Latvian school every Saturday. And she, led, uh, she ran the, the, the camp. There was a summer camp that all the kids went to uh, in, in California. And eventually she also led, uh, for a few years, she led the um, summer high school program called Cursa, which was up by Seattle. Um, so my mom was doing all this stuff. My dad was doing other stuff, uh, you know, running other organizations. And I was involved in everything. I did Latvian school. I, I did folk dancing. I did choir. I did, uh, I did volleyball, uh, just everything. And so I was very active in Latvian community in, in, in San Francisco. Uh, over time, you, get, you start meeting Latvians from all over the place. I went to Gutteser's uh, Summer High School in, in Michigan. So I met all sorts of Latvians there from all over the country. And so eventually I just sort of got in, in, in the, into the whole swing of things in, you know, as far as nationally La with, with, with regard to Latvian society in America and Canada. At the same time, of course, I was, I was doing the sort of the, the traditional stuff, you know, that you have to do you, you, uh, going through normal American high school. Uh, yeah, going to university and then, and then going on to law school. So I had sort of these two aspects of my life. I had this, you know, the, the, the sort of normal American life. And then I had this whole Latvian thing going on, which yeah. some of my American friends did. You know, they always thought it was really cool, but they didn't really know what Latvian was and yeah. do you speak Latin or what, what is this? <laughs> so I was always kind of a bit of a curio, I think, for my American friends. Yeah. But, um, um, yeah, but I had these two, two aspects to my life. And, and, and this whole Latvia thing is what pulled it all together. It was really interesting. I, it, it, it happened by, um, again, happenstance to a certain extent. I had been, our family had come to Latvia uh, before the, the, the breakup of the Soviet Union. We'd, when, when we were first allowed to travel in, we, we, took a, we, we got a visa and came in and met, met our relatives. That was like in the late uh, 70s, I think, um, it was our first trip. And it was just, you know, Quite it was a whole crazy, crazy. Yeah, it was just so different than it is now, of course. It was very gray, you know, all the typical stories you hear about the Soviet Union. Uh, but it was a really exotic trip and also just a really emotional trip, just meeting the you know, relatives. And, and they're so interested in, you know, what's going on out, out, out in the real world, or not the real world, but out in the Western, Western world, I guess. So, so we had a series of trips with our family, got to know people in Latvia, um, and... In the midst of all that, towards the uh, towards uh, the late '80s, I guess in, in 1990, in that period of time, I met Yanis uh, uh, Jurkans, who was the mm -hmm. who was the first foreign minister of Latvia, and the, he invited me into the foreign ministry. He thought it'd be cool to have a you know a young lawyer in the foreign ministry. I don't I don't know if he knew or I knew what, what, what I was going to do necessarily, but 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 I, at the time, I thought it was really a great opportunity. So I took a leave of absence from work. I was working in. Um, I was working in a uh, software company at that point uh, in the law department and came over. And um, uh, that was in 91 in May. Uh, came into the foreign ministry and just tried to help with whatever I could help. All sorts of odd jobs and English language stuff yeah. and, and, and meetings, things like that. And then the coup occurred in Moscow and Latvia became independent. And you know, I was in the, in the foreign ministry and also we had all sorts of, of uh, foreign ministers coming through to recognize Latvia's independence. And I was in on all these meetings. It was really interesting. I got to meet James Baker from America, and I got to meet Genscher from Germany, and, and all sorts of you know, all sorts of interesting meetings. Um, and so that I prolonged my time here. I thought I was going to be here for like six months or something like that. Yeah. So I prolonged my time. Um, uh, and during this crazy period of time, I met a guy named Philip Clavins, who's yeah. you know who became my law partner. He was uh, his story was that he was from I, I hadn't met him in America. He was Philip was from New York. And he had been working with a firm called Baker McKenzie in New York, and he took a leave of absence to come to Latvia to teach in the law school for a bit, or lecture, at least yeah. in the law school. And then we somehow met just because, you know, small society, crazy times there, and, and, and we ran into each other. Someone introduced us. And then Philip came in and started helping out in the foreign ministry because we had so much stuff to do. There was, you know, there was so much, uh, you know, where he could assist, and we, we could work together on things, on these meetings and everything. And... So yeah, Philip came to the foreign ministry. Uh, we, you know, everything was going on, and then as things started dying down, they, you know, and 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 and, and uh, you know, uh, all the all these all these visits became, you know, started calming down a bit. We started being approached. The foreign ministry started being approached by the first foreign investors in Latvia, 
and they would come in and ask about, uh, well, you know, the opportunities here. They have generally they had some ideas of what they want to do themselves, and then they start asking about, well, you know, are there lawyers in town that can help us with something? Are there you know financial people we yeah. can speak with? And so Philip and I thought, God, this is kind of a cool opportunity. There's nobody else, you know. And so, so that was sort of the initial bit of business. We thought, okay, let's open up our own law firm and, uh, and see how it goes. And, and so we started, um, basically start working out of Philip's apartment and, and meetings we would hold in downtown Riga somewhere in the, in the Rome uh, uh, Hotel or, what you know, it's just in the reception areas or wherever we could find. And, and right away, yeah, we got plugged in. Actually, the first big project we worked on was the Kellogg's. Kellogg's did the production f uh, facility in Odishi. Mm. And they had already been interested in that, I guess, several years earlier. But then, uh, yeah, they, they, they went ahead with that project. That was our first big client. Um, and, and just things rolled from there. So, and I've been here ever since. So, in a sense, uh, <laughs> this opportunity uh, was revealed from uh, because of that demand that basically existed here. People yeah, wanted to just to have your expertise, your knowledge. On yeah, it. I mean, I it, you know the, the market at that time was so different than now. Yeah. Now, now it's a very competitive market, uh, very qualified people in different firms working here. At that time, we were I mean, for a foreign investor coming in who wanted to work yeah. in English and wanted to see basic corporate documents the way they understood them to be, we were kind of the only game in town because at that point, uh, you know, all the lawyers who were in town were Soviet-educated lawyers. You know, they wouldn't, if they could speak in English, they weren't able to work in English. Um, and so we sort of, you know, it's, it, yeah, literally it was, it was just an incredible opportunity because we were the only, you know, the, 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 the only people in town who could, uh, who could, you know, well, speak and work in English, put, put together corporate documents uh, the way we had learned to do it in America. Um, and, and what was, you know, that these business people expected to see. And um, and then as you know, as we worked with a few, you know, the first few, then the the foreign investor community at that time in the in the nineties in Latvia was pretty small also. And so, you know, they would they would speak with each other and they'd and and they'd say, well, who do you use for lawyers and who do you use for audit and these types of things. And generally, we would then be referred on to the next client. So it was just it, it was just easy. It was really easy. I mean, you know, it was and the work was challenging, but getting right. clients was was. Again, it's so different than now. Now it's very competitive, and we have. To, at that point in time, I, th I remember it was like maybe ten years into into our work. I can't remember what year exactly, but we finally started understanding that okay, there was a you know, competitive situation developing in Riga, and we had to start doing some sort of marketing. We hadn't, you know, we hadn't even considered doing marketing up until then. So, um, yeah. So that was the beginning. It was just an incredible opportunity. You know, it was just something that you couldn't plan, <clears throat> but we were able to take advantage of it, and also. You know, as with opportunities, it, it just fell in the right, it, 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 it was at the right time in my life when I could do something like this because I was a young lawyer, I wasn't married, I didn't have a house in America that I had to consider what to do with. Uh, because I know I had a lot of acquaintances in America who also thought about coming to Latvia, but uh, for various reasons it was, it was difficult or they couldn't do it. Um, but for me it was pretty easy and, and so it was, this, it was this, this, this combination of this really great opportunity and also th that time in my life when I could do something like that. So yeah, I took advantage of it, um, and like I said, here I am, thirty years later. <laughs> I think uh, the same uh, kind of the experience is uh, further broadened when you have well, you have ha been the chairman of the uh, Amcham. Yeah, basically. Uh, yeah. And as I understand, uh, well, but this position also maybe brought a new perspective and maybe consolidated your previous knowledge. So, how do you see uh, maybe the experience in the uh, from nineteen ninety two? How it has impacted uh, maybe how you approach that position and all the yeah, yeah. experiences you get there. Well, how I specifically approach the Amcham position, or, yeah, or I just would say uh, the maybe how it has helped you uh, when you were there, mm -hmm. or maybe just what you have also gained uh, further than you know speaking with foreign clients that need yeah. this kind of an expertise. Well, Amcham, I mean, <clears throat> the American Chamber of Commerce in Latvia, we also we have a similar history as we do with RGSL. We, yes. we, we were there at the very beginning. We, we, we wrote the, uh, the charter for American Chamber of Commerce and uh, were involved in, the, uh, 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 you know, in, in all the organizing efforts. And we've been on the board eventually, you know, essentially ever since the, very, you know, the first board that, uh, that, that Amcham put together. So that's part of our, you know, that's part of our history, and we'll, you know, we, we always try. Actually, we, yeah, we we still have a board member, uh, who, one of our one of our colleagues now, Sonimus, who is on the board. Um, 
So, yeah, we have a real strong history with AmCham it, at that time in the 90s, especially when we were, you know, most active uh, and, into, well, also, you know, past the 90s into, into you know, the last, you know, 20, 30 years. It's been a good opportunity. I mean, that, 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 especially in the early days, though, it was a great place to meet people. It was just, um, you know, again, given the fact that it was, again, it was relatively small for an investor community here. Um, they sort of, you know, the investors, and not just, you know, it would be American investors, but also other other investors who had uh, similar, you know, had similar out, uh, view with regard to how to do business that would also be interested in being the, in the American Chamber of Commerce. So, so it was a good group of people to meet with. Um, it was also a sense of, uh, you know, shared interest. We all, most of the people there had a similar background in this sort of post-Soviet society, and so. You know, you could kind of support each other, and you could uh, give each other hints about, okay, where can you get the best groceries, and where can you, what's, what's the what's a good restaurant to go to. Um, so that was important in those early days as well. You know, with regard to the American Chamber of Commerce. Again, now it's real different. Now it's a, it's a very corporate organization. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, very very well organized, very well run by the office. Uh, um, you know, in the early days, it was the board basically running the, the organization. So you had to, you had a lot of extra work. Also, you'd have to be contacting people, and like I said, now we have a staff that does those those types of things. So, um, so much different again. It's really different, uh, yeah, than it was in those early days. But it's been a great, it's been a great forum for us, and uh, and and we really we you know we enjoy supporting it uh, up to to this day. But when you came back and you decided, okay, let's uh, let's found a company, uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's do it. Let's uh, do it. <laughs> yeah. So it is it is 90s, and uh, you have a degree from uh, US. Right. How it is how it was with you in practicing right. law in Latvia? Right. Also, also, yeah. No, good question. And it's also uh, at that point so much easier than it would be now. It's uh, you know. Uh, yeah, I was accepted into the uh, uh, Sworn Attorneys Association here in 92. Uh, that was the first swearing in they had, actually, of, you know, of uh, attorneys who had been trained in the Soviet system, nice. and then Philip and I were part of that group as well. And at that point, uh, you know, again, remember, it's at that point, there wasn't much law here. It was, yeah. it was everything had, you know, the, the Soviet law was in the process of, 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 you know, they were in the process of getting rid of, rid of it. Uh, most of it, at least, um, the civil law. You know, the basic civil law had been enacted, and then there was just patchwork bits of law that that started coming in uh, through the early '90s. So, you know, there was no real body of law here at that point. It was, um, and in that sense, there was really nothing that you know. Nowadays, you have to go through a series of tests, and you have to prove that you know that you know you know what you're doing, and you know the law. At that point. You know, it was uh, we. Our test consi uh, consisted of, uh, of you know, Philip. Well, we had different interviews, I guess, but Philip and I went in to the uh, you know to the, the head of the, the the sworn attorneys association. It was basically an interview, just uh, confirming that we had. The, I think we needed like five years' experience. There was there were some other requirements, and confirming that we had that. You know, what was our background basically? What kind of education we had? And and that was about all that, that, that at that point was deemed necessary to, to become a you know a member of the of the sworn attorneys association, and then you know so and then we got in on the on the ground floor essentially when laws were just starting to be created, so we could along with all the other Latvian attorneys who were here who were grown up in Latvia, uh, we could you know we could learn the law as it as it as it came came along, and then it was changed of course a lot of these patchwork things were changed when when Latvia uh, was heading into the EU. So uh, and then again, we could follow those laws as they were developing. So we kind of, you know, we we learned along with everybody else here. Nobody else really had an advantage over us at that point with regard to the law. And in, in a in a sense, I'd say again, in that in those early days, we sort of had the advantage because we knew, we you know, we we knew from the United States and our practice there, you know, how laws essentially are going to work in 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 a in a you know in a, uh, a democratic environment, a business oriented environment. So you know, we kind of knew where the laws were headed. Um, and in that sense, we could work easier with the clients and 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 develop the contracts along the ways along the, the the way that they understood and wanted them to be. So again, it'd be so much different if we came in now, you know, because there's a huge body of law here now. And coming as as just a U.S. trained lawyer, uh, it would be a big job to, to you know to catch up on the law and then and then you know, again go through the testing that would be required to become a member of the Sworn uh, Attorneys Association. So. Again, just opportunity in, the, in those early days where we could, you know, get in on the, on the ground floor, basically. I think I like how you define this uncertainty as opportunity and freedom. You know that you have, you know, basically where the law is heading, but 
at the same time you're just experiencing how it's forming uh, yeah. with case law you know on every day so i think uh, many of us may of course uh, see this as a really kind of a challenge you know uh, the chaos maybe and how how the laws might may have been uh, you know influenced also and lobbied uh, to a certain extent not to the uh, well to the for the public interest and and how do you see that uh, how was there some kind of a challenge uh, maybe uh, before the accession of the European Union on how these uh, laws were also uh, maybe influenced yeah there was a challenge I mean it was, it was challenging it was um there were certain, you know, there were, there were often in those, again, in those 90, in the 90s, ahead of prior to entering the, the EU, there were often times where there would be no law in place for something that we needed to consider. You know, the, the client had a situation, and then it would be, um, you know, it, it, there would be various ways to handle that. We would, we would, um, we actually would work sometimes with the ministries, and, you know, uh, and, uh, on, on behalf of the client. Uh, to, to, to put something together, to, to, to try to patch up a situation. Uh, that, that happened relatively often. Sometimes you just couldn't uh, get, you know, there, there would be no legal, I mean, you couldn't fix it, you couldn't fix the law, let's say, and let's say there's, there's a gap in the law and, and you're writing a contract to address that. That's what you'd have to do. You'd have to, you'd have to you know, you have to work the contract somehow to address the, 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 the gap in the law, let's say, and, and hope that that works. Uh, so there'll be different ways of handling it, but but yeah, it was challenging at that time. Uh, but again, it was extremely interesting. It was something that you know, you, uh, you know, coming from from the U.S. and the, and 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 a really, you know, the U.S. background where everything is set and and in place. Is, I mean, of course, laws are changing there as well, but still, it's 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 been in place for for a couple hundred years. Um, and coming into this environment where it's just, you know, especially those early days, kind of the Wild West. That that was really challenging, but at the same time really fun and interesting too. And you'd be working with the client; yeah, the client would understand as well, mm -hmm. you know, you'd be, it, because it's important, of course, to describe to the client, okay, what's going on and what we can do about it. And the client would kind of work, you know, the legal uh, department, let's say, of the clients we worked with would, would you know, would would try to assist us with, uh, you know, the, in, in their understanding of how we could we could work our way through this. So, are yeah. you still uh, a member of bar association or practicing law in the U.S.? I'm a member of the Bar Association, yeah, I've kept up my membership uh, because it's such a, it was so hard to become, it was a three-day bar exam I had to go through I'm a, oh, okay. in California, yeah, it was a, a, a big job. So I'm still a member, I'm an active, or I'm, I'm sorry, I'm an inactive member, but I'm a member, but I don't feel like could, I, I don't practice law there anymore, I mean, I haven't practiced law there for really ever since I, I came right. to Latvia and started the firm okay. here, it's, it's been pretty much solely Latvian law at this point. Um, yeah, so I would I wouldn't feel good trying to practice law there anymore. Um, I guess I just keep it up because I don't know. Again, the you know everything I went to through to get the the the, the accreditation. Uh, who knows? Maybe I could use it at some point. But but basically, um, I, I wouldn't practice California law because I'm so far I'm out of it at this point. Fair enough. Yeah, or, uh, and from my like uh, what I was thinking, it may look good for uh, you know a big tech company maybe based in. Uh, California, so that you have this expertise at least, uh, and, and they you can have, yeah, that basically you can have this kind of a multinational. Yeah, well, uh, well, I mean, in terms of, of uh, speaking with potential clients yeah. here, I mean, that's I, and again, especially in those early days, <clears throat> that was that was it was you know that was something that was, I guess, assurance to yeah. potential clients that okay, you know, Philip and I and then other colleagues of ours, come, you know, kind of knew what we were. At, at least we had experience in, in you know, in a, in a, in a situ in an environment that they would understand. Uh, so yeah, that was that was important at that point. I, I, since I'm not planning on practicing law in California now, I wouldn't really be using that experience to to try to find clients in California unless they're coming here to do something. So yeah. How is uh, with Alex? Did the, the very foundation started here in Latvia and then expanded further in both in other Baltic states or? No, no, it was um, <clears throat> basically each of the LX offices, the, each of the offices that are now LX, the three Baltic, uh, you know, in Tallinn, Vilnius, and Riga, were, uh, st established themselves independently. They were indep just like our firm okay. was an independent firm. We were working, we started working as Kavich and Sleidinch and then kind of went from there. Uh, also, the same thing with the Ride Law office in, in Estonia and, and the Valiunas office in, in Lithuania. They were also well, certainly the Valionis office, I think, was one of the first law firms in, in Lithuania to get going. 
and the ride law office also was 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 in the very very early days in Estonia. So we every all of us started working independently. <clears throat> But what was interesting during those, during those, maybe not the super early days, but like in the 90s, like towards uh, the late 90s, we had larger clients who were doing things across all the Baltic countries. Um, again, as people, as, as companies nowadays see it too, the Baltic, three Baltic countries form a market essentially, um, you know, that's, that's of a decent size as opposed to each independent country. <clears throat> so... So the uh, so we had clients who would come in and say, well, we're doing something in in all the Baltic countries, you know, could you work with, uh, you know, they would put us together with, and often we would be together with the Valiunas firm in Lithuania and the Raidla firm in Estonia to do a project across all the Baltic countries. So after a while of this, we started thinking, huh, it kind of makes sense that maybe we we already put ourselves together, because uh, it seems to make sense that there's a Baltic market essentially. Um, you know, it would be good to be able to cover that Baltic market uh, and agree on how we work. Uh, you know, business practices, all these types of things. Um, so yeah, it, it just it, it it just seemed like the right thing to do at the time. Uh, Again, an excellent opportunity how to respond to the demand. Just... Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean. Yeah, and, and and again, it was it was like right in our faces, basically. Yeah. <laughs> it was, yeah, it was like a lot of a lot of thinking that God, you know, do we do this? Don't we do this? But it just seemed like the, yeah, we have to do this. Um, and we had good colleagues. We we liked those firms, those offices. Um, you know, we we got to know them pretty well. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, yeah, so then we established. We were the first uh, Baltic alliance uh, across all Baltic countries. Um, and yeah, and that's how we, we that's why, you know, why we came together as, uh, as an alliance, essentially, as opposed to, let's say, you know, making it one firm right away, but, but working as, you know, have, having worked as three independent offices from the very beginning of time, let's say, uh, since the breakup of the Soviet Union here. And then we formed the alliance and then started, you know, developing our practice and how we work together across all three countries, making sure that we, you know, we have the same way of uh, you know putting together contracts and working with clients and these types of things um, which yeah that's something we've been working on for for the last 10 years or so but you are president of the foundation of basically latvian law well kind of so, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> yeah i wanted to know how did you uh, end up choosing your field of law because you are in commercial and merger and acquisitions yeah so basically business and companies and how to, how a lot to of money <laughs> so to how to yeah yeah mistakes. well i uh, i put it this way i mean i uh, actually my uh, the first part of my practice back in california when i was a really young lawyer and i started working in a law firm in california i was kind of a, interested in and i was kind of Part of the pull to the law for me was I kind of liked the the acting aspect of it and going to court, you know, going to court and you see the, the TV shows and all that stuff. And that attracted me to a certain extent. Um, so I tried some litigation doing some uh, that was part of the practice, not all of everything I was doing, but some going into court and helping on smaller matters with the with the, the more experienced lawyers. But over time, over like the, a couple of years of doing that, um, I started understanding I really don't like the litigation. I, I really respect people who you know who do it, and and um, but I didn't like it just because it's 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 um, it's uh, most often it's very negative. It's arguing. You're arguing. Yeah. Basically, you're yeah. arguing about stuff, and I, that's not my nature. I don't like arguing, and I like and, and that's that led right to the transaction work to M and A, because that's generally a positive situation. You're putting something together. You're, you're trying to make uh, you know these you know these companies have plans, and then you you're helping them make these plans happen. Of course, in M&A, you get into tense situations as well, in negotiations, and sometimes things don't work out, and people get angry, and all these types of things. <laughs> but uh, but in general, it's a positive, uh, and and that's much more my nature. And so that's why um, when we when we started the the firm here, actually, I, I sort of stopped working with litigation in California already, and we started work here. Then I knew that I just wanted to do the you know the M&A and corporate practice. Again, I would say an excellent time when to start that because, of course, uh, in the 1990, uh, in the 1990s, uh, a lot of companies looking to this market, uh, wanting to, you know, establish their presence. And but yeah, how do you see how has the field changed really throughout your practice? You know, maybe uh, what clients demand, maybe how the public views that, or maybe just legislation, the regulatory environment. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it certainly has changed. I think. Almost all those things you mentioned have probably changed to a certain extent. Um, um, I mean, the client demands that you know that was another. It was that, but that's um, 
yeah, that has changed, you know, how you work with clients since from the time that we started in the early 90s. But that's something that's not just Latvia or the Baltics. That's actually something that's changed in uh, pretty much the whole world in terms of how lawyers work with clients. Because it still at the time that we started up our practice, it was, um, you know, the, the, the lawyers would do their thing and they and, and generally would bill on an hourly basis and and would generate, you know, big legal memos for clients to read. Basically, a non-business oriented way of working. And, and that started getting, you know, it, clients start, you know, started, started demanding. But this was like, I don't know what year it would have been, but like maybe 15 years ago, I think, when, when there, there was a real push from, from companies all around the world, I think, uh, to, uh, with regard to law firms and how they work with law firms, that they want a, they want a business oriented uh, advice. And that, and 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 we've had to recalibrate how we work with clients just because of that, because it's it's the way you have to work with clients now. They demand it, and it means it means you know number one, being able to uh, to to provide uh, some sort of fee uh, estimates, understanding about fees up front already, as opposed to just working and generating bills. And you know, clients they have a budget. Of course, it's understandable. Uh, you know, legal counsel within an off within a firm uh, within a company has to report to the board and they have a certain budget they need to meet and so it's understandable they they need to know you know what what's the expectation here so we need to be upfront about uh and 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 be able to come up with some uh you know some sort of an estimate fee or fee caps uh, these types of things we need to be much more business oriented in terms of the way the advice we provide to the client we nowadays it's it's you know it's it's, it's if, the, if there's some sort of research involved in what you're looking into you do the research but you come back to the client with, with you know, as short of, uh, as possible a summation of, let's say, what Executive what it summary. means. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And then you can, if you, okay, potentially you could patch on, you know, the longer research behind that executive summary. But but the, the generally the client just wants to, you know, what's the bottom line, you know, and what does it mean for me in this situation? So you need to anticipate that as well, uh, and also you need to be um, proactive. Also, you need to not wait for the client to say, you know, you point out all these problems, but you need to also be able right away to say, okay, well, and here are some p potential solutions. Whereas again, back in the old days, it was more, you kind of wait for client instructions, you'd come up with these big legal memos. So uh, like I said, that's, that's pretty much changed worldwide. Um, you know, certainly in Europe and America, the way that companies work with lawyers and, and we've, we've certainly felt that here in Latvia as well. We've really had to change the way we work uh, with clients over these years. So it's, I, I say it's much different the way you know the way we work with clients now as opposed to you know what we started up in the in the nineties. But how do you deal with this uh, sort of? Um, you have so many roles to play as a head of a company. It's not for you anymore to be just like attorney uh, solving meeting with clients. It's also about leading the team, uh, making sure that no one is arguing with each other, being <laughs> like the dad of the fa of the company and the team. So how do you combine all of these roles? Um, do the leadership kind of thing? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, it's true that at this point, I you know I'm I'm not as hands on with regards to the agreements and and the, the actual uh, legal work we're generating. You know, a lot of times I'll be reviewing things, uh, and uh, but but you know, but um, so that that certainly has changed for me, and I am more of a manager, I guess, in that sense, uh, and overseeing how you know our M and A group works, and then also having responsibility for how the firm works as such. Um, but you mentioned the team, actually. That's one other thing I really like about uh, M and A work and the way our office is set up is it's real team oriented it's it's and i've i've always been a team player i've almost all the sports i played i was really active in volleyball and basketball and all these kinds of things uh you know, through the university years and i really uh i really enjoy working as a team and really seeing people you know kind of pulling the right putting the right people together to put an effective team together and seeing it work sometimes it doesn't work you need to change something um, and so that's something that also, regarding the question of why M&A, that's M&A generally is a teamwork type of thing because you need to, you're working on a transaction. Uh, it's not just the M&A lawyers who work on the share purchase agreements and things like that, but you also need specialists in the firm, depending on the industry you're working in, who know the regulatory stuff. Um, competition law is always a big issue. So we have, you know, you, you, you're, I'm always checking with our competition people as to do we need it? You know, what do we need to do in, with regard to this transaction? So you have to pull a team together also with regard to transactions and, and a bigger transaction. You could have a, a group of, I don't know, six, you know, six lawyers working on that project uh, at the same time. Um, so how I, how I do that, I, I don't know, it, 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 it sort of has just 
organically happened, you know, in, in terms of my growth within the firm and, and here in Riga. Um, I enjoy doing it. We have a really good team of people. Um, and, um, and so it's something I, I never, <clears throat> excuse me, I've, I've taken some, some courses in the sense of just continuing education courses and checking in with uh, other law firms and how they work and exchanging best practices. We do a lot of that. Um, but I haven't, you know, I, never, I was never really educated in, in, in management. Uh, I was just educated as a lawyer, really, my formal education, which is, which is another aspect of, of, of law firms that's interesting is that most law firms are like that. The, the, the lawyers are lawyers, and they really don't have, a, you know, a business education or a management education, uh, although, again, that's changing a bit over the years. Um, so, so it's, um, yeah, so in that sense, it's uh, learning on the go as to how, to how to run a firm, and each firm is run a bit differently, usually. Uh, um, yeah, and, and just implementing, you know, practices that you, you, know, that you like, that you want the firm to, to follow. You, you say you don't have uh, the experience, you know, the education in management, but how about the BA in political science? Wouldn't you say that that has well, really helped? No. <laughs> no, I wish I could. It'd be nice if I could say, yeah, that was, that, that's really been great. I mean, it's, it, it was a great education at Berkeley, and, and, uh, but, but yeah, the political science, it, it, it's, it was a very interesting subject. But it didn't give me any management, uh, okay. you know, give me any management expertise. It was, uh, it, you know, what, what, what became pretty popular in America, it was uh, taking, uh, I had some, some friends of mine also who would take the, um, they, they, they got their first degree, their bachelor's degree, like I did with political science, and then going on to the next degree, to the law degree, which was a three-year course of education, there was a possibility also, in, in certain cases, to do the, uh, the JD, the, the Juris Doctor, and an MBA at the same time. And that, that, that started getting into where you start picking up on management and business expertise, which is that, you know, that, that would be useful. But I didn't do that. <laughs> I well, kind of learned, learned on the run. At you know? least, uh, I like the, what we were talking before the interview is uh, that it's interesting that in, in uh, US there's this system where you need to have this a social degree, like a social science degree uh, before. So basically, a good way how you can maybe uh, acquire more general understanding of, of how the world works, you know, maybe throughout history, maybe throughout, uh, if, if it's a political science or maybe sociology, and then building your expertise on with, you know, certain regulatory... Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, in America it wasn't uncommon. I mean, the usual bachelor degrees that you'd, people would get before going into a law degree would be like uh, more liberal arts. It'd be, you know, political science, it'd be uh, history? history. Yeah, it could be history, it could be literature, those types of things. Although there would also be people coming from the hard subjects uh, uh, also from, from time to time. Um, but, but it was not unusual in, in the American context for, for also there to be a few people, not a lot, but a few people going to law school with really varied degrees, like art or something, or I, you know, I ran into some of these people as well. Which, which is really neat, I think. It, you know, it does, you, you, you do develop a, a much different background and, and that might be a person who, who would use the law in a different way than, 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 than let's say, I would. And, and in, in doing a law firm, they, they might you know, want to be active in the art community. And, and, and Yeah, yeah, or even art law and, you know, I, I don't know. And also many, in, in America, it's pretty common also for, for graduates from law school to not necessarily have a classic legal career, they would go they, because a, a legal education is is it's it's really a good education just to you know um, for many things in life, and so there would be people who would go off and do all sorts of different things after after uh, graduating from law school. Um, so yeah, so it's it was it wasn't a real just one track thing with regard to you know the people coming into law school and then going out. There was all you know people doing all sorts of different things. What would be your, maybe you have more, more than one example, but what would be your uh, good example or bad example of, maybe both, of uh, <laughs> situations when um, something didn't go right, according, for example, in uh, mergers of companies or uh, maybe a late uh, submission or a deadline approached of uh, specific documents or something that didn't go yeah. right and did go right? Yeah. <laughs> No, of course, yeah, it, mistakes happen. Um, luckily, I, I don't, I don't know of any major mistake I've made that made like a you know major difference in a, in a merger or with regard to the client work or something like that. I mean, the one thing I I, I did learn uh, from a, a big client of ours, I remember uh, um, that I've, I've kept in mind pretty much the whole the whole time because again, yeah, certainly mistakes do happen along the way. You try to you know take care of them right away or. 
Um, but but the, the, the lesson was that, that uh, it's really important to be open with a client about it and not try to hide it. I mean, because it's just usually going to get worse. Um, and yes, and, and like I said, a big client of ours, um, we did, there was something where there was a, uh, I can't remember what the, what the exact mistake was, but there was a bit of a, a goof on something which we could fix. But, uh, and we did speak to the client and, uh, and they were really thankful about it. They, they, they understood, they were, they were not too bad. Uh, kept working with us, we kept working on the deal, everything in the end worked out okay. But, uh, but they said, yeah, that they, that, that they really appreciate the fact that, you know, that we spoke with them, we were open about the situation. They could kind of plug in and help, you know, from their side to see, you know, how they wanted this thing to be resolved. And, um, and so, yeah, it's, it's generally been good advice to, to, if you do run into a problem or a mistake or anything along those lines, which is always, uh, yeah, it's, you, you have a really bad feeling about it, but, um, but to be open with a client right away about it, just to, you know, say, okay, we've got this situation. But again, again, you know, have ideas in mind right away as to how you could fix the situation. Not just say, okay, well, we've got this mistake, we've got this problem. <laughs> uh, but to say, okay, but we think we could do this or that. You know, the client may have some input. So, um, yeah, so again, yeah, it's, of course, it's life and mistakes happen. Um, but, but, you know, I, you know, thankfully, knock on wood, I've been able to, uh, you know, nothing, nothing major, major has happened. It's been th things that we've, we've been able to fix and move on from and, and of course, learn from. That's, you know, that's also part of the whole process. Maybe some greatest success story that you would say, okay, I did this really good. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> or even unexpected success. Maybe. Yeah. Oh, boy, I don't know. <clears throat> I mean, nothing pops into my, I mean, we've had, you know, I've worked on these really cool transactions. And I mean, we, we from the beginning, we've worked on, on some of the largest transactions here in Latvia. And I mean, they've all been in, you know, they've all been really cool. It's all, you always have, I mean, that's the other thing about M&A work. And well, also, well, you know, litigation, it could apply as well. That there's always that, that, that real adrenaline rush when you, when you see that it's all going to work, you know, that the, the deal's going to come together. Some have, you know, some are harder, uh, some, uh, some are easier. Um, but uh, yeah, but in the early days, I mean, we, we worked with, uh, uh, well, I mentioned Kellogg's was one of our first big clients, but then we also had Cable and Wireless who was doing their investment in La Telecom uh, prior to, to Telia coming in. Um, uh, we did the, we worked with Ruhrgas in terms of privatizing a portion of Latvia's gas uh, utility and they worked with them all the time while they were still, uh, still active here. Um, just many, many different projects, and each one had its own challenges. And, and the other thing that's really, really neat about working with these clients, especially here in, in Latvia, is that you get, you know, the clients are from all sorts of different countries, and they have all sorts of different ways of working. So, for instance, Cable and Wireless coming from the UK had a certain way of working. Uh, Ruhrgas coming from Germany. I remember, I remember the, the, the uh, in-house legal counsel, the main, the main man uh, that we had to work with was a guy named Dr. Benzin. And he was just like a really strict, but really kind of, he was really cool, but a really strict German lawyer. And at that point, he, I know he could kind of consider us as young kind of, uh, you know, we were, again, that was in the 90s when, when we were kind of doing our thing in Latvia as best we could. <clears throat> and so he would kind of, you know, take us under his shoulder and talk about how, and in fact, Dr. Benzin, uh, uh, what is his, I think his name was Wolf Reiner Benzin, he uh, introduced us to an organization that we're still plugged into. It's, it's called the IBA, it's the, the International uh, Bar Association. And it's pretty much the global uh, lawyers organization for law firms. And uh, yeah, he, he, inter he told us about that organization. That he's, he was like in the board or something of that, of that, of that organization at that point. Uh, and because of him, we joined it and went to the first conference we went to it was in Berlin in Germany in the 90s sometime. Um, but, but the point being that these different clients from different countries have different ways of working and different cultural aspects, which makes it so interesting. You know, it's, each client is, it's, it's so cool. It's like each client has, you, you have to rediscover how they want to work, you know, what their industry is, whether it be, you know, gas distribution or, okay, telecoms or insurance or banking. Each one's different, like a different world. And it's, it's really interesting to be able to kind of, for that period of time while you're working on that transaction, to be in that world and be, be, you know, working with this certain client. And of course, certain ones may be a little di more difficult to work with, some are much easier to work with, um, but that's all part of the game as well. So that's really, that's another aspect I really like about M&A. It's just really variable. It's always, you know, you're not, in a sense, you're, okay, you're working on similar documents like share purchase agreements and things like that. But again, all the clients are different. Each transaction is different, a different dynamic. So it's, it's, real, it's real interesting. <laughs> I've been thinking, if, for example, uh, a student from RGSL uh, decides, okay, that mergers and acquisitions seem interesting and I want to go this path, 
uh, of uh, studies and later on also professionally, what would be the main skills that, for example, you look for in a new newbie <laughs> lawyer or someone who is still in the process to become a lawyer? Yeah. Hmm. Um. Maybe some values that you very much appreciate in your company, mm -hmm. uh, in your law firm. People mm -hmm. oriented, maybe, as you said before. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely that. I mean, that's, you know, again, in M&A work, it's not something where you're going to hide in a library and do a lot of studying and uh, researching. It's, it is going to be more people oriented. So I think what, you know, that's certainly one um, aspect that I would look for is uh, would I, you know, how would I be able to work with this person? How would this person be able to work with clients? Um, so yeah, I think people skills would be important, and of course, you know, the bottom line is you you do need the academics as well. You know, so you're looking for people who have, who have uh, you know, had a had a good academic uh, uh, success, uh, interested in the area, of course, uh, in in, in M and A. Let's say, um, um, what else? <laughs> recommendations, of course. I mean, if, if there are some sort of recommendation, if there's a, again, it depends if it's, if, I guess you're talking about a very young student, so that would be. Yeah, basically students uh, different. Uh, currently of uh, yeah. bachelors or. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, with students, it is a bit more of a, in English, you'd say a crapshoot, basically, because you're not, okay, you know, you don't have experience. You don't, you haven't, it, as opposed to hiring, let's say, a lawyer with five years experience, let's of say. Course. Then you, then you can, you know, see their body of work, basically, potentially get some references. You have much more information about them. Mm -hmm. But that's why we have, uh, and you know, several other firms in Latvia, uh, and again in Europe, it's pretty common to have like internships. Um, so, so we do take on interns uh, every year. Uh, we don't have a set amount we take in each year. It just depends on on how things are going. But we've um, that's a great way to get to know people. Is it, it with it, you know both for the the per person uh, doing the internship as well as for us. And and some of our best young lawyers have 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 come into the firm that way. It's basically starting as an intern. Um, you know, seeing how we work together, seeing how they work with M&A stuff, um, and you know, if they work well, which has often been the case, then then it just sort of takes off. Then the person you know stays with the firm uh, as a young lawyer, starts working with the team, and uh, and that's uh, that's the best way to really you know really get to know somebody and see if they fit in fit in with the firm. Yeah, because actually, I would say that for uh, students, not all, not only necessarily law students, overall there is the, there are these jokes on LinkedIn. Then basically, yeah, <laughs> companies expect that the student will have five year experience before even yeah, graduating yeah, yeah. and that kind of I thing. Know. No, it is. That's that's the difficult thing about students. I remember when I was a student coming out too. There's no, you know, you don't really have much experience you can point to. Okay, you have your academic career. Yeah. But, yeah, but of course that's important too. But but still, it's it doesn't guarantee anything necessarily as to how that person is going to be able to work with that let's say M&A work um, so it is a bit you know that's why I think um, you know that's 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 where the internship possibilities where you actually get to know somebody over a period of time and work with them um, you know really really play a role um, yeah definitely after if it even doesn't work out for uh, both of them staying at that specific company uh, you can ask for a recommendation then, and then the next uh, employer yeah, can definitely yeah. know whether uh, you're okay at least at yeah, in yeah, yeah. an intern level, so they can definitely. Yeah, take you start you building on. your expert, your, your experience. You yeah. start building some experience that way as well. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Maybe slowly, slowly wrapping up. I just wanted to know how do you, you know, decompress after work? <laughs> <laughs> how do I decompress after work? Um, Oh, I, I, I guess sports has always been important for me, although now my sports has changed from, uh, well, we used to actively play basketball. I, was, I, was, I at least kept that up. I, my main sport when I was in university and, and even for many years after university was volleyball. Uh, but then I kind of, after several years of volleyball, I stopped that. I kind of felt I had enough of that, but I kept up recreationally. I kept up basketball. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I kept up basketball for many. We'd have like maybe once a week. I'd we'd have a basketball game that I, I'd play. And that that's always that was always good. Although I stopped that a few years ago now because it's getting a little too traumatic. And getting sure. again, you know, getting a little older, and maybe maybe you gotta watch out a little <laughs> bit more. So so sports has been important. I guess nowadays it's more like running and and you know just general mm -hmm. just general physical activity of some sort, whatever I can get. Um, I I I don't know. Otherwise, it's, it's I really enjoy being with people I mean even at the end of the day where you're with people quite a bit although the last few years of course you know we've been online and stuff like that which and then I really crave being with people again but no I like I like just uh, be, you know getting together with friends uh, when I have an opportunity and uh, 
Um, these kinds of things. I like reading. Uh, you know, if I get a chance, that's usually not on the weeknights, but on the weekend, if I can, if I can carve out a couple of hours to do some nice reading, I, I really, I really val I crave that sometimes. You know, just again, that's sort of the opposite of what I was saying. It's kind of being away from people for a bit, just to recharge. But but sometimes that's that really helps me again, too. Uh, reflecting on the demand of of your own needs. In yeah, sense. yeah. Just it's it's changeable. I guess it's changeable what I like to do, but. Uh, but yeah, yeah. It just depends on, I guess, the situation and what I can, what I, what's available to me. I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think this has been a great interview, and thank you for coming. Unless there's something you want to ask us, or maybe but, um, tell to the future lawyers <laughs> on the camera, in front of the camera. Or so maybe, maybe next year, students, given given that you know we are meeting today on the start of summer. Yeah. Oh man, I, I <laughs> some, see this some, big, some big statement. I don't. I don't necessarily have a big statement. Uh, I, um, yeah. I mean, I guess this. I guess from my experience, I guess what I could say is, you know, if, you know, be, keep your eyes open for opportunities. I guess. I mean, that's played a huge role in my life. Uh, you know, things, <laughs> things that happened to me that I would never, never have imagined I'd, I'd be doing. And I've and, and and have been really important for me and really great things that I've been able to do with my life just because of an opportunity arising. And so I think I think okay, if I was going to say something, some big statement, it would be to to to, to keep your eye open for opportunities. You never know where they're going to come up, and don't hesitate to jump in. And if, if something seems like uh, you know it's going to be something that's that's very that's interesting to you, give it a try. I mean, you know, you can always change later on. You can do something else, but. But it's worth jumping in and trying things. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Yeah, Thank well, you for thanks for having time. me. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me.